Okay, so welcome to the last day of class for B two eighty A. So today we will cover um, just sort of bits and pieces of of topics that I think are sort of important uh, as you go out there and at least have some sense of what's going on with an MRI exam. Um, and um, and then we'll leave some time at the end for end of course logistics um, and additional questions. And then um, you know there'll be office hours as well. Okay, so any questions before we start on um, either the material from last time or course logistics, anything? Okay, so everyone, oh yeah, go ahead. No, the last one, you're done with that. Um, and I think everyone did really well, so I'm not even gonna talk about it. So um, most people did very well on that, okay. Um, okay. So I think today we're going to talk about slice selection, talk a little about noise, talk about imaging of flow, and then some future directions in MRI. Uh, there was a question last time about what the colors in this plot meant, right? And so you can sort of see here that there's these um, red colors here and then bluer colors here. So um, basically, as I, I did track this down, so those colors represent fractional and isotropy, or FA. Okay, so that's what we talked about last time. So a value close to one, if you look at an FA map, just means that um, it's highly anisotropic. Okay, 1.0 is the maximum you can get. And then zero would mean isotropic. So there's no preferred direction. So you can sort of see here in these bigger fibers, it's saying it's highly anisotropic. Um, and then out in here, the smaller fibers, it's saying it's not as anisotropic. Now, whether that's true or not is actually, it's really an issue where you have to be careful anytime you look at data to understand what the limitations of the measurement are. So in the bigger fibers, you know, it's pretty easy to measure if there's diffusion in a certain direction, right? There's a lot of signal, but as you get to the smaller fibers, you know, there's be a lot more uncertainty, a lot more noise. And so your estimate of FA is gonna go down. And so probably a lot of those blue numbers if you could, if we really have the measurement abilities to go down to that level, could probably be much higher. But given the fact that our resolution and our our sensitivity is low, um, so it's not to say that the FA is less in those fibers. It's just in those voxels with fiber bundles, maybe there's, you know, many fibers fanning out. Okay, but any one fiber is still pretty anisotropic. Okay, uh, so that's what that figure meant. Um, in any case, you know, anytime you see DTI, typically, um, especially in science, it's always, you're always trying to make your figures as colorful as possible. So they just look nice, right? So that that's a nice way to do that. Uh, this is a nice, another nice figure. That's, so thank you to Eric for sort of pointing out this. This is an article that came out earlier this year, which is sort of the latest, uh, one of the latest things in terms of using fMRI. Um, and in this case, they're decoding speech, basically, can I tell what someone is listening to by just measuring their MRI signal? Okay. So they had subjects. I don't, I just sort of skimmed through the methods on this, but um, I'll give you an overview just so you get a sense of the way they do. This is pretty much how we do all fMRI decoding. Um, but of course, this is like, if you look at the paper, this is like a massive undertaking. This is probably like, you know, a couple of years or several years of a PhD thesis to do this, this work. Okay. Uh, essentially, they had subjects listen to like 16 hours of audio um, of like programs like I think The Moth. Have has anyone heard The Moth, right? A podcast or Modern Love is another one that they mentioned. So they basically listened to a lot of audios. And then they they painstakingly like annotated the audios and gave semantic meaning to every phrase and word, right? So they could sort of, I think they had like 3,000, something like 3,000 features or something. So then... Uh, they they also had the subjects listen as the subjects were listening they were measuring their bold response okay so then they could make a, make a mapping and say okay um given some semantic um you know features in the data i can predict what the bold response should be okay so you're sort of mapping from the semantic features of the language to the brain response okay and then the other, now you want to go the other way. You want to go from the brain response to actually predicting what the person actually heard or, you know, estimating it. So here they're showing that 
they're using the brain data. So you have the brain data. And then from the brain data, you can sort of come up with some probability of what sort of semantic features were in, were, were being uh, sort of stimulated. But then there are still many, many words that could happen, right? So they need to use a very large language model and they use some version of GPT to do this, okay? So uh, a transformer model that sort of helped them predict sort of given uh, sort of some of semantic features, you know, what might be the most likely sort of words that were seen, okay? Some, some candidate words. And then each of these sort of potential um, things, you could predict what, uh, brain response it would give, and then you just pick the one that's the closest to what you actually observe. Okay, so it's always sort of you're predicting something and you're comparing it uh, to what you actually see, and then you pick the one that sort of minimizes the error. And as you can see, it does pretty well sometimes. Okay, so it says that night I went upstairs to what had been our bedroom, and not knowing what else to do, I turned out the lights and lay down on the floor. That's what they heard, and this is what the brain response said. We got back to my dorm room. I had no idea where my bed was. I just assumed I would sleep on it, but instead I lay down on the floor. Okay, so that's pretty good, right? So um, so yeah, this is only gonna get better with time, which is sort of both interesting and scary at the same time. It means that, you know, you could be walking through the Amazon store and they could be measuring your brain waves and figuring out what you wanna buy before you even know it, okay? So, um, so anyways, uh, it's going to be a very interesting future, I would say. Okay. Any questions on this? So this is sort of every year, every year there's like one or two articles like this. And I think we're going to see more and more of these, especially with uh, chat GPT and the, 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 the power of these models becoming stronger and stronger. All right. Okay. So this is something we've seen before. And the, so this is, uh, you know, what a typical console might look like. And so we've talked a lot about these parameters like echo time, um, repetition time. Uh, today, we're going to start off by looking at, where is it? Um, hmm, where is it on this? It's, it's, oh, slice thickness here. Okay. So we've mentioned this before, but this is such a key parameter that um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I just want to give you a sense of how it works because it is sort of one of the fundamental features of any MRI exam, which is uh, in MRI, we typically... The basic imaging we can do is either 2D imaging, where we do one slice at a time. We excite a slice, we reconstruct it, we do another slice, and then we reconstruct it. So that's called 2D imaging, and that is still done quite a lot in clinical imaging. Uh, and that's basically what we talked about. We most, mostly talked about 2D 4A transforms. Um, but the other thing, the other uh, scanning you could do is you could do a full 3D 4A transform, right? You could acquire... KX, KY, and KZ, reconstruct that and do a 3D transform. So that has advantages and disadvantages. So both 2D and 3D imaging are used um, in clinical practice. So I just want to give you a flavor for how the how you would select a slice because it's such a fundamental aspect of MRI. Um, so previously, we've talked about the whole idea of the RF excitation is to take your equilibrium magnetization and tip it into the transverse plane where it can process, okay? And previously, we've just imagined we're gonna excite all the magnetization everywhere, okay? And so that's called non-selective excitation, right? There's no, all the spins are treated equally. But what we'd like to do is what's called selective excitation. So essentially, we only tip the spins in a certain slice, okay? So these are the only spins that are gonna be processing and giving us our signal. And so we only have to worry about the signal from that slice, all right? So if we look at what MZ and MXY are doing, before excitation, we assume, say, we have M sub Z at, with a value of M sub zero, the equilibrium magnetization. If we select a slice, after we excite it, then the M sub Z goes to zero, okay? And the transverse component goes to M sub naught, okay? And this delta Z is in our slice thickness. Okay, so that's the parameter we set in the console. So when you say five millimeters, then the, um, the, the program does some computations and we play out the correct RF and gradients. And so we're going to just talk a little bit about what those RF and gradients need to do to get that slice selection. So before we do that, let me just remind you 
that the key with uh, RF excitation is if I have magnetization here, I need to, uh, I apply an RF pulse. Oh, I have one. I have the pen. Well, let's just use my finger here. The RF pulse would be here, okay? And so this, if this RF pulse goes at the Larmor frequency, then the magnetization comes down. And if this RF pulse is at a different frequency, then the magnetization doesn't really get perturbed. Okay, so I need to be on resonance, right? So this is just to remind you, this is an on resonance pulse. And as you can sort of see, it does tip the magnetization down, okay? And so that's what we want. And then here, the idea is if I'm not on resonance, then um, I don't really tip the magnetization, okay? So you can sort of see where we're going to. If I want to excite, like a slice of spins here and not excite these guys, I want to give all the spins in some region a non-resonance pulse. So it means I'm going to have to have a lot of different frequencies here, but no frequencies out here, okay? So in the Fourier domain, I'm going to have energy in some frequency band and no frequency at other frequency bands, okay? So let's see how we would do that. So now... So, so far in RF excitation, we've only talked about RF pulse, but now we have to think about the gradients again, okay? And so the gradients is, imagine um, this SS stands for slice selection, okay? And so imagine we apply a gradient in the Z direction in this case, okay? And this is gonna make spins process at different frequencies as a function of space, right? So if I only wanna excite, so these have different frequencies, and if I only wanna excite spins in this band, and I, I just have this frequency, then only these spins will be excited, right? None of these spins will be excited as much, okay? They might be excited a little bit, but primarily only the one at this area where I have the right frequency will be excited, okay? So without going into too much detail, this is sort of the, the basic concept of how it works. Let's say I prescribe, I want some delta Z, okay? And apply a gradient, okay? So this means this spin here, let's say, let's say this spin is processing at F naught. This percent is processing at F naught plus delta F. And this would be processing at F naught minus delta F. Okay. So if I plot on the frequency axis, I have F naught, F naught plus delta F, F naught minus delta F. Okay. So basically I just need a band of energy at uh, I had energy in a in a in a confined. Oops, let's try that again. All right, we're gonna have to reconnect. Okay, great. Um, so this is just going to be a rect function, right? In the frequency domain with some bandwidth. And the bandwidth is just a product of my gamma over two pi times the gradient I turn on times delta Z, okay? And so what sort of function so in the frequency domain, I have a rect function. Therefore, in the time domain, I must play out a sync function as a function of time. Okay, so now this is a sync function in time. Okay. So right now, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of MRI scans being done like right now. And they're all playing out. They're, most of them are playing out little sync functions. So there's like sync functions being played out everywhere. Like here on at UCSD, there's sync functions being played out right now. Okay. So that's because that's the function we need to get a slice selection, right? Because this waveform has the property that it's um, a rect function. Now, in practice, we can't play out an actual sync function because a sync function goes from minus infinity to infinity. So we'll sort of have a truncated sync function, okay? So instead of a pure rect function, then we're gonna have some slice profile that's not perfect, okay? But to first order, you can imagine it's a sync function, all right? So uh, this is a nice mechanical sort of demonstration of how this property works. This is what's called, uh, you can look at the YouTube link, but it's called Barton's Pendulum, okay? Uh, which I had never heard of until I sort of Google, I, 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 this is like from the YouTube rabbit hole that I found this. So, um, um, so the basic, the idea is what you're seeing here is you're seeing pendulums with different lengths, right? And so as if you go back to your uh, physics classes, you know that, uh, you know, the um, uh, the frequencies can be like square root of like L over G or something like that, right? So these are going to have different frequencies of oscillation, right? 
And then here, this is going to be, imagine this is going to be the RF pulse. Okay. This is going to have a certain frequency of oscillation. Okay. And these are like in a gradient field, right? Because they have different frequencies, right? So what we're going to see in the video is we're going to set this going. And then you want to see which one of these actually starts oscillating. Okay. So let's take a look at that. So here, they're sort of just, you know, random motion here. At some point, I think right around now, you'll see a hand come in here. Let's see. There we go. There's a hand and it lets go. So that's the RF pulse, right? And so it's oscillating. And you notice that it sort of perturbs all of them a little bit. But over, over time, this is the only one here that is perturbed. Okay. So this is essentially slice selection in a mechanical, uh, sort of mechanical analogy of how slice selection works. It's essentially the same principle, okay? You basically create a gradient of frequencies, and then the only the ones uh, in the area where you are, you're driving it are going to, to get excited, okay? So um, we're not gonna do this example in depth since it is the last day of class, but uh, just so you know, typically the calculations that go on is you know, if I have some rect function with a delta Z of 10 millimeters, and typically you're going to get an RF pulse with some uh, T, like some width, say 400 microseconds, and then you can always calculate the amplitude of the slice selection gradient to use. And then you can also, you know, calculate all the parameters. So in previous years, we would have done that, but this year uh, decided not to do that. So in this case, I would calculate that the gradient would be 0.587 gauss per centimeter. Okay. So one thing I will point out though is a sort of interesting thing is like here I wanted a slice, a rect function, right? And it turned out the RF pulse I needed to play was a sync function. So obviously the Fourier theory is coming into play here. So the question is, what if I wanted an arbitrary profile? Would it just be the Fourier transform of that arbitrary profile? It turns out the answer amazingly is yes. I can actually, any profile I want, in the magnetization, I can implement to first or by just taking the Fourier transform of that profile. Okay. Um, so actually, I'm going to skip over this. And so that's what's known as multi dimensional excitation K space. So any profile I want, okay, so this is the profile I want. Okay. And it turns out that this is the RF pulse I'm playing. Okay. And I basically can go, so the profile is essentially uh, the Fourier transform of my RF pulse as I go through K space, okay? So the gradients take me through K space, and as I'm going through K space, I'm putting, the RF pulse now is putting energy down in different parts of K space, and then that's what creates the, the, the profile, right? So for example, in this case, and, and the, the only tricky thing is you sort of have to work backwards. So at this point, if I think about this gradient area, if I go backwards, I'm at the center of K space here, right? If I think about in integrating it backwards, okay? And so in terms of K space, this is the center of K space. And this is just saying I'm putting the most energy in the RF pulse is depositing the most energy at the center of K space, okay? And this puts energy out here in K space, and this puts energy out here in case space. So essentially, you can think of it almost as 3D printing, okay? Each part of the RF pulse is laying down some magnetization at some frequency, and then you layer all those frequencies, and together they form your profile, all right? So it turns out that that's you can do really cool things. Like, let's say I want to just make a circle. So instead of exciting a slice of magnetization, I want to excite a circle of magnetization. Okay, then I could just take the inverse Fourier transform, the Fourier transform of this, and then this RF pulse sort of lays down the magnetization along some, the, the gradients take me through K space, and as I'm going through K space, the RF pulse is laid down some magnetization, and that's what creates this profile. Okay. Uh, you can do even do really cool tricks like this. So in this paper, which is, as you can see, quite old, uh, I believe this is the author's wife. Okay, a picture of the author's wife. So he took the Fourier transform of this picture. All right, 
And then he basically uh, used that, implemented that Fourier transform and made the RF pulse and the gradients such that it deposited energy. And then he imaged the magnetization. And this is the image of the magnetization in the phantom. Okay. So obviously this is just a trick, you know, to do try it, but it's just showing that you can actually take this to the limit, that you can actually paint in any magnetization you want into the object. Okay. So this is, it's sort of interesting because you're not, this isn't like post-processing, right? This isn't like, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're making some pseudo image. It's actually, you are, you are making the magnetization do exactly what you want it to do. Okay. Uh, so one of the practical uses of this um, that actually Professor McVeigh was involved with many years ago is, let's say you want to just do a simple pattern, like implement a line, right? So to first order, you can think of that as maybe you're, you're implementing a cosine function. Okay. So remember the cosine, the Fourier transform of a cosine is just two delta functions. Okay. So in fact, if you play out two delta functions in the presence of a gradient, you know, you can get pretty close to something like this. Okay. And so here the, you've actually implanted the lines in the heart itself. Okay. So now since those lines are, of, those are lines of magnetization in the heart itself. So now when the heart deforms, those lines will also deform. Okay. And so if you're a bioengineer, now you can start thinking about measuring stress and strain, right? Um, and so this is done clinically, um, you know, in certain, in certain cases to sort of get a sense of, for example, if you have hypertrophy in a, in a heart, you know, um, you know, stress and strain will be different than if you have a normal heart. Okay. So that's all we're going to talk about for RF excitation. So it is sort of one of those things that's a huge area of research, but uh, just want to give you a taste of both slice selection, which is sort of very fundamental, and then sort of the fact that you can actually do a lot of really cool things with it. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? Okay. So let's go to the next one. So we're, we need to talk a little bit about uh, noise. So uh, I think all of you have an appreciation that as you increase the noise level in an image, uh, I think this is already shown in a previous lecture from P P Professor McVeigh, the image quality degrades. Uh, I can reduce the noise by averaging, right? Increasing the blurring, spatial blurring, but then I give up, um, you know, sort of details, right? I'm essentially blurring out my details here, okay? So I'm just gonna give you a very quick overview of how to think about noise in MRI. We're not gonna have time to go into depth, but just wanna leave you, I'm essentially gonna leave you just one thing to think about, okay? So how does noise come in to an MRI exam? Well, there's two things. One is this parameter here is next. So that's like how many averages I'm gonna do of every acquisition, okay? So two next would be, I essentially acquire the data twice and average it, okay? So if I really need to reduce the noise, I will increase the next, but that comes at a cost of time, right? Next of two means that I'm gonna do twice as many acquisitions, okay? The other parameter that comes into play uh, is bandwidth, okay? Um, as we'll see, it, we're not gonna go into depth on this, but this is essentially proportional to one over delta T, okay? So the bigger the bandwidth of your acquisition, the smaller the, the sampling of the a to D converter, all right? Okay, so let's just review what happens in an MR exam. So we have spins processing here, right? And we're gonna measure their signal with an RF coil, okay? And we're gonna use Faraday's law, and it's gonna turn out to be that we're going to look at the, um, the, D, the D phi DT of, whatever magnetic flux is varying within these coils, the electric field is the derivative, the time derivative of that, all right? So what that means is if I have something of, you know, that's varying as e to the minus j omega naught t, right? If I take the ddt of that, I've got a minus j omega naught e to the minus j omega naught t. So I've got this omega term that comes out when I take the time derivative, okay? So it turns out that um, I've got this M, the magnetization is proportional to B naught, okay? And this omega naught is also proportional to B naught, okay? So the total signal I get out is proportional to B naught squared, 
All right. And then in noise, and once again, just we're gonna give you a very high level view of this. There's really two sources of noise in MRI to first order. Uh, thermal noise of the receiver coil, maybe electronics, but usually, hopefully not. and then thermal noise of the sample. So the idea is in both the coil, you have just electrons and things just bumping around and moving around just due to thermal noise. That's gonna give you some electric field, magnetic fields and some signal. And then in your body, you've got stuff just moving around, right? You've got charged particles moving around. And so there's electric fields from that, okay? And magnetic fields from that. So it turns out that for most of clinical imaging, you're dominated by the sample. And that's what you want, right? If you design a system and you're, de you're de dominated by the instrumentation noise, then that's not good, right? You want it to be dominated by the sample noise, right? And so you typically want to design it such that you're dominated by the sample noise and that the variance of that sample noise is, since it's just a signal like the signal you want, it's also proportional B naught squared. But you have the advantage that it's random. So you could sort of average it out a little bit, okay? So that turns out that if we look at the SNR and MRI, you've got this V-naught squared term, and then you have the standard deviation of the noise, so the square root of this term. And if sample noise dominates, which is what you want, you get that the SNR is proportional to V-naught, okay? Which we talked about before, and now we're just going, providing you a little more depth into that. And so that's sort of this V-naught SNR curve, is basically linear, okay, to first order. And therefore, that's why people have been building bigger and bigger magnets, okay, to get into this higher SNR regime. But it's very expensive because, um, you know, for every Tesla, it's at least a million dollars more, okay? So say going from three to seven Tesla, it's probably more than a million dollars. With siting costs and everything, it's probably going from two to three million dollars to maybe seven to $10 million. And then if you want something beyond that, then it, the cost increases probably more than super linearly, okay? Okay, so we're just gonna talk a little bit about, uh, just remind you that in all of, in science in general or statistics or whatever you, we do, signal averaging is really important, right? That's how we reduce the noise. And so if I have two measurements of the same thing, so Y1 equals Y0 plus N1, Y2 goes Y0 plus N2, if I sum the two measurements, I get two Y0 plus N1 plus N2. But if the noise is independent, then the variance is sum and the total variance is two sigma N squared, okay? And so when I look at the SNR, I get this two Y0, but it's the square root of two of the standard deviation. And so that's why I get the square root of two of the original SNR, okay? So the most important thing uh, from this discussion is this. SNR is therefore proportional to the square root of number of averages. And in general, it's proportional to square root of time. Okay. So in all, basically for any scientific experiment, measurement experiment you do, this is sort of, if you just keep this in mind, that allows you to think about things in the most practical terms. Basically every doubling of SNR is going to take you how much more time? If I want to double my SNR, how much more time do I need to spend on the experiment? Four, four times, right? Yeah. So SNR is really expensive, right? So if I'm losing half my SNR due to a problem, I've just made my life four times as difficult, right? Not just half, not just twice as difficult, four times, okay? So that's why it's really important to look at SNR, okay? SNR is very expensive from a point of view of time. If you And if you assume that time is linear to money, then that's why it's expensive, right? And in general, uh, it's either linear or super linear because, you know, um, like in a clinical setting, uh, you sort of get paid by procedure, right? So let's say you get paid $2,000, right? You, if, whether it takes you two hours or a minute, you get paid the same amount, okay? So if you're running a radiology business, that's why the radiologists are very happy. Like if I can sell you an MRI system that does a scan in like half as much time, you just doubled your income, okay? Um, so let's just talk about without, I'm just sort of skipping a little bit of a lot of detail. So in the end, it turns out that SNR uh, 
is really related to your signal over the standard deviation. And it turns out that the first order of this is really related to how much volume magnetization you have. So this is delta X, delta Y, delta Z. And this sigma N, remember, this is sort of proportional to one over, uh, sort of this is proportional to, yeah, sorry, let me get this eraser. Okay, so basically, uh, let's just make it simpler. S and R, we said, is is the sort of always proportional to square root of measurement time. Okay, so for an MR exam, we have the number of averages we do, which in that thing is the next. So that's what it's called in MRI, the number of excitations I'm going to do. I have NX, which is sort of the number of KX samples I have. And I have number of the phase encode, which is the number of KY samples I do, assuming 2D imaging. And then I have delta X and delta Y, which is my resolution in the X and Y direction. And I have my slice thickness, right? Okay. So in general, what can you, what are you allowed to set? Well, you can set the voxel volume. Okay. So let's think about that. If I go from two millimeters cubed, right? To one millimeter cubed, I've gone from eight to one. So that's an eight, one, eight to one reduction in SNR. So reducing resolution is really expensive in terms of SNR, okay? So that's why you someone shows you a two millimeter by two millimeter cube image and you say, well, that's great, but I really want a one millimeter cubed image. Well, that's gonna cost you a lot to get the same SNR, right? Because a factor of eight in SNR takes you 64 times the amount of time, right? So you're like, well, I don't really wanna do that. So unless you find another way to reduce the noise, you're gonna to have to end up spending 64 times as much time, okay? So that's so this is very expensive. The measurement time we already talked about, and we'll look at one example of that. So um, you can gain back SNR by increasing measurement time, but it only goes as a square root. So it's very expensive. And then this is determined, this is sort of, you know, your, we can monkey with this with you know, your echo time and your TR and other parameters. Okay, so that's also up to you in terms of, you know, you certainly don't want to set these to hurt you, right? Because let's say you set the echo time too long, so all your signal has disappeared, then essentially this F goes to zero, right? And so you're hurting your SNR there. So the main things we really need, so these are all things you need to think about when you're designing experiment, okay? Is how are the sequence parameters affecting your signal? What voxel volume do you really need? Okay. In general, the rule of thumb is you never want to go to any higher resolution than you think you need, okay, because it's quite expensive. Okay. So typically um the, the clinical parameters are set at the resolution that radiologists think they need. And then measurement time is uh depends on the circumstances. So if you are scanning uh like a dead, you know, an excised brain, you can maybe scan it for hours. But if you're scanning uh an infant you know, you may only have 10 or 15 minutes of good data, okay? Because they're moving around, they wake up, they cry, okay, things like that, right? So let's like a, just an example to sort of drive home that really the defining feature is always SNR is square root of time, okay? So here we're looking at two different examples in case space where I can either acquire 256 readout samples or 512 readout samples. So in this case, delta KX is twice as large here. So the FOV would be what? Uh, so let's say this is FOV of B, FOV of A. So FOV of A would be one over the FOV or sort of half the FOV of B, right? And um, the, res the resolution is going to be the same because I go as far in case space, okay? And assume that um, the sampling rate for sequence two, so this delta T, to get this, this smaller delta T, this has a smaller delta T. So this delta T is smaller, okay? 
So there's all these parameters and you can think of, well, these seem to be quite different here. I'm having a smaller Delta T. So every sample is probably noisier. Okay. Cause I'm averaging less than that Delta T, but I'm acquiring twice as many samples. All right. And, but I have a different FOB, right? And so the question is, you know, how does all this come into play? And it turns out you can think about it that way and get really confused, or we can just say, look, I'm spending the same amount of time acquiring both of these acquisitions, okay? So I can just go back to this rule that it's a square root of measurement time. And so if I look at the SNRs and I calculate it using some other methods, I actually end up with the same SNR, okay? So that means that, yes, it's good to do this for the calculation, but you can always standardly check it at the end and say, how much time did I actually spend? And the time spent is how long was the A to D converter on? That's the amount of time. It's not... Like, it's not like if in a five minute scan, it's not how long the scan took, it's how much time were you actually collecting data in that scan. That's your measurement time, okay? So anyways, uh, just something good to keep in mind uh, for any sort of scientific experiment that SNR is a proportional square root of time. Okay. All right, any questions on that? Okay, so we just have one more topic that has, um, some MR physics, and then we'll sort of move into future things, which is uh, another really important thing that I want to leave you with is how do we characterize flow with MRI? Because that is also something that comes up quite a lot in clinical exams. And so it's good for you to have a sense of what that looks like. Um, and it's a similar picture to what we talked about with diffusion. But now with flow, there's coherent motion, right? It's not random. Okay, so we're going to get a slightly different answer. So imagine we have two spins, one is static and one is moving at a certain velocity, okay? And we put it in the presence of a gradient. Uh, this is a negative gradient. So this static spin loses, sort of goes counterclockwise here. This spin here moves into an even negative, more negative part of the gradient. So it goes even more counterclockwise, okay? And then I reverse the gradient and that wait the same amount of time. This spin here saw this negative gradient for some amount of time and equal and opposite gradient in the positive direction. So it's net gradient that it saw is zero. So it's back at zero phase, okay? This spin here moved into an area of more positive gradient. So it overcompensates and ends up with some net phase, All right? So it turns out that the phase is proportional to velocity, okay? So that's a really important concept in, in imaging of flow that if we can measure the phase of the MRI signal, we can actually estimate the velocity. It turns out that we can write out an expression for this. It turns out it's here where previously we've looked at, um, uh, oh, this is what we just had. We've, we've looked at this before. This is our G times position vector. And previously we we'd assume that this is just some X naught value. It's just some position, right? But we can now assume motion. Let's say X is changing with time, with velocity and acceleration, okay? And then you turned out that the phase is proportional to what's called the zeroth order moment, the first order moment, and the second order moment, okay? And so the velocity comes in with the first order moment. The position we've already looked at is the zeroth order moment, which is just the area, okay? So the key is we want to make, we could make this zero, but make this sensitive, make this non-zero. So then we'll just sensitive to velocity, okay? And so uh, here's an example of how you do that. So clearly this gradient pair has zero area, right? So we're still at the center of case space in terms of imaging, but it turns out it has a first order moment given by this equation, G naught times T squared, okay? So these by, anytime you see, bipolar gradients in an MRI pulse sequence, you sort of have a sense that there's something to do with flow here, either flow or diffusion. We're trying to somehow sensitize ourselves to motion, okay? Uh, this is a picture from the MRI question showing the same thing that here, if I play out this bipolar gradient, if I'm a stationary spin, I change my phase, but I return back to zero phase. But if I'm moving, I keep accumulating phase and I have some net phase. And this is the phase difference that we want to measure proportional to velocity, okay? Uh, typically the way it's done is we'll play out a gradient this way and a gradient this way and subtract the two phases. That just sort of compensates for background effects. 
it just turns out to be a little more robust. Um, in any case, we can ask, get an estimate of the velocity based on that phase and also the gradients, the amplitude and the duration that we set, okay? So we know all the parameters. So this is what it looks like. Um, just to get a view sense of what it looks like. This is a, what's called phase contrast and geography. And this is sort of an axial plane uh, through right around here, probably. Okay. Um, and so what you see here is here's the jugular veins. Okay. So obviously it's saying there's a positive velocity. Okay. Um, and then here's carotids and the vertebrals. And they are the, the opposite sign because they're going in the opposite direction. Okay, so that's good. So basically, and the value of this tells you the velocity. So you can sort of see the carotids are darker, so they're moving at a higher velocity than the vertebrals, okay? And here it looks like the jugular is probably on the order of the velocity of the vertebrals, but not the carotids, you know, are, are the major flow into your brain. So they're gonna have the highest velocities, okay? And then you can also do that during the cardiac cycle. So this is plotting. Uh, the left carotid, the right carotid, as a function of time during the cardiac cycle. And you can sort of see here, it goes up to 45 centimeters per second, whereas in the vertebrals, it's only about 25 centimeters per second. All right. Uh, here's an example of phase contrast going in the, um, you can sort of see here, if I put the um, gradients in this direction, right, I'm sensitive to flow that's in this direction, okay? So I'm seeing these vessels here, okay? Because I'm sensitized to motion in that direction. And so the flow is going this way, okay? Here, if I make the gradients go in this direction, now I'm sensitized to flow going left to right. And so here the vessels are flowing this way and here the blood's flowing that way. And here it looks like there's something going on. There's some extra bypass um, flow going on that may have clinical relevance, all right? And the cool thing is you can also do this uh, where one, one place this is used is in cardiac imaging. So you can sort of gate it to the R to R interval and acquire data throughout um, the heart cycle. The problem with this though, is it's it's sort of, it's not like CT where it's just snapshot imaging. You've actually got to do this. You have to do over repeated cardiac cycles. And so typically that's one of the challenges. Typically you have to have the subject hold their breath so their chest isn't moving. And so you just, acquire enough uh, velocities and then enough case space to, to reconstruct it. But if you do that, you can actually come up with these pretty cool images here. So this is just showing you the velocity flow field through the heart during the cardiac cycle, okay? Um, and sort of a cool fun fact is uh, one of the students who took this course when it was first offered many years ago actually went on to do his residency and fellowship and actually started a startup that actually does this now and is now also a faculty member here too. So um, yeah, so that's 4D flow. So this is what's called 4D flow, okay? Okay, uh, one aspect of 4D flow, one, one thing that you have to understand with phase contrast and geography is because it's based on phase, once the phase goes beyond pi, there's some uncertainty. Like, did you get, like, if I have pi phase, did I go this way or did I go this way? I don't really know, right? So I could have gone this way to get pi or this way to get pi, okay? So the velocity which gives you pi is what's called the vank. And that's a parameter that is typically set that you'll see and that the, the technician has to be aware of. Because once the velocity is higher than the vank, that's the velocity where you've gone beyond pi. And so you don't know. So then in that case, you've gone from positive to negative flow, okay? So here's an example of this, where in this vessel here in the pulmonary artery, the bank is set to 15 centimeters per second. So it looks like within this um, artery, there's flow going both ways, okay? Now, in really, in some circumstances, there can be really weird flow in vessels, right? If there's aneurysms or tortuous flow, and so it's not totally out of reason that you might see weird flow like this, okay? This is pretty pronounced, so it's probably not clinically, you know, um, likely, but in this case, uh, the bank is set too low because you've gone beyond the pi. And so here, we just set the vent 
the bank is now set to 30 centimeters per second, and you can sort of see all the flow is in one direction. Yes? Is there any drawback to setting the bank high? Um, there is in terms of if you want to sort of like, um, you know, if you're like, you never, like, let's say you're only interested in flow of like one to two centimeters per second, right? And you set the bank at 30, then your the phase is down here for one to two centimeters per second. So you don't want to set the bank high enough, but not too high, because then you're losing sort of measurement accuracy. Okay. Uh, so the idea is that, you know, it's not totally trivial because even in one vessel, you can have, oh, this is what we're seeing, sort of, especially with laminar flow, right? As, as you know, the velocity at the borders of the vessel is sort of slower than at the center. And so you can sort of have the center going the, the wrong way if your bank is set too low, okay? Okay, so that's phase contrast angiography. The other type of angiography we're gonna talk about is called TOF, which is time of flight. And this is also very um, commonly done. So if you have an angio done on you, uh, most likely it will be time of flight, okay? Unless there's a specific reason, they probably won't do a phase contrast angiography on you. But time of flight is something we even do in research if we just want to see where the vessels are, okay? And so the basic principle behind it is, remember, and you know, sort of, you've just sort of done this a little bit on the current homework, is um, there's T1 relaxation, right? So if I have relaxation and the TR is long enough, then I can recover all the way to M sub zero. But let's say the TR is short, Right. Then it turns out that I never get back to M sub zero. And in fact, if I repeat this, I sort of go to a sort of a low level, a steady state level of magnetization. Okay. And so it turns out that we can actually use this in what's called the inflow effect. And this is a nice example of something that, in some instances, is an artifact. Like you're basically, things appear bright. Um, or your signal is enhanced by come, think flow coming in. So in certain, some circumstances, people think this is an artifact, but this is an, a case where an artifact becomes your signal. So here's the idea. Here's the magnetization before you started imaging, and this is time. And then as you apply these RF pulses, right, you're reducing it from M sub zero down to some steady state. So let's say this is M sub zero, and this is now steady state magnetization, okay, because you're applying these RF pulses. But guess what? But you're only, let's say you're only applying the RF pulses in some slice here, okay? So this is where you're applying the RF here. So guess what? These spins that were out here never saw those RF pulses, right? So they come in with fresh magnetization, okay? And if you repeat that process over and over again, what you'll find out is the best, the, the, the sort of this part of your image gets brighter than this part. Okay, so anything, because fresh blood is delivering fresh magnetization, okay. Uh, so the concept of magnetic saturation is you saturate things here and then tissue outside comes in with fresh magnetization. So anything that's flowing in will appear brighter than anything that was not flowing, all right. Uh, so this is the concept here. And so here you're seeing these really bright vessels here. That's the inflow effect, okay. And so that's essentially unsaturated blood comes in, has more magnetization, and then um, the signal is darker for things that haven't flown in yet, all right? So with that, you can uh, uh, get these really amazing time of flight and geography uh, things. And the really nice thing about these is you don't actually need contrast to do this, okay? Now there are, in certain circumstances, you know, you might be, there might be contrast injected, but things have gotten so good that the general standard of care uh, for most radiologists is just do it without non, just do non-contrast, okay? Um, like, uh, and then you can also have, you know, here's an artifact where the flow effect gives you signal loss. So in this case, remember we have a, a, a the spin echo pulse, so 90, 180, and we refocus the magnetization here, right? But let's say we made this echo time really long so that the blood, saw the 90, but he never, the blood moves so fast that it moves out of the 180 where the 180 is applied, in which case things don't get refocused and you'll end up with these signal voids, okay? So that can be an artifact that you would have to deal with. Okay, so we're gonna just spend about maybe 10 minutes giving you an idea of sort of future directions and then we'll 
sort of then moved to uh, end of course, um, taking care of that business. So any questions before we move on from flow? So once again, just giving you a flavor of what you can do with MRI in terms of measuring flow. All right. Okay, so there's obviously a lot of things I could talk about in terms of future directions of um, MRI. We saw a little bit of that when we talked about deep learning. So um, that's one aspect. And we've touched upon this a little bit um, previously, but uh, one of the things is that MRI is still a relatively expensive modality, right? It's typically a million dollars per Tesla um, to have it. And it also requires quite a bit of infrastructure, right? You have to have the power. You typically, if you actually, for many magnets, you have to have venting for the helium to go out. You have to have a room that is strong enough to hold the magnet. And also you have to have shielding around the room to, to prevent the fields from going into uh, affecting people outside the room, okay? So all in all, it's, it's typically at least a million dollars for Tesla. And it's also quite prohibitive where if, for example, um, you know, you're in a, a developing country where, um, you know, there's really not the electrical infrastructure or, or, you know, it's just not reliable, then it's really hard to cite a magnet. So there's been a lot of interest in terms of as the manufacturer seeing, you know, where can they sort of expand their business? Where is there a need to look at, you know, what's really uh, taking the most cost? The biggest cost is the magnet and the cryostat. Okay, so if you can reduce those costs, it's a huge gain. The next one is the grading amplifiers and the grading coils, okay? So the computers and the electronics don't really cost that much, and these can come down in cost. So really, a lot of the emphasis is on how do we reduce all these big costs, okay? And here's one of the reasons. If you think about it, this is um, relatively recent, but this is how many MRI systems there are per million. Uh, Germany has quite a lot. I think the U.S. is probably on this order. I don't, it'd be good to know that. Canada's less, Ghana less, and, and India quite low. Okay, so there is a lot of disparity in, in who has access to high-end MRI. Okay, Germany, obviously, there's Siemens there, and so they, they basically have lots of MRI systems. And here in the U.S., we have GE Healthcare and then Siemens, and, and so we, there's not, um, you know, so certainly in San Diego, there's no dearth of, of um, MRI systems. But even if you go into rural areas in the United States, you might find that it's hard to get imaging. Okay. So what are things that people are trying to do to address this? Well, we saw this in a previous lecture. This is Siemens is Freemax, but there's other things, um, other smaller magnets that are coming out here. And they all have the uh, the property that they use conduction cooled magnets so they don't really need as much helium and so they don't need the quench pipes, okay? So they're just much easier to cite. For example, we could probably, without too much trouble, cite one of these in this room, okay? We'd have to still add some shielding, but at least, you know, since this is on the first floor, we don't have to worry about building like venting for the helium to get out, okay? We've talked about this before. This is the, um, uh, the hyperfine portable magnet, right? This is actually, I think the Gates Foundation just bought a whole bunch of these and is sending them to Africa and seeing how well they, you know, whether that can improve care in Africa. Um, but you can sort of see here, there's a real push, especially for like the, for like things where you could use a smaller magnet. So these are both in ICUs for neonatal ICUs. So really small magnets that you could cite um, in the ICU for neonates. Okay. Because those are not, um, you know, you could bring, here's one where they're creating something where you could bring the the infant into a regular magnet, but um, it'd be much easier if you could just scan them with, right in the ICU, okay? So there's a lot of interest in that. Obviously, it's a little easier because you can make a smaller magnet, and so um, there's less heat to dissipate, okay? Uh, the hyperfine we talked about, and just sort of touching up, sort of weaving two themes together, is um, what really sort of allows them or a key step that they found that they needed was they needed to be able to go from images like this to slightly better images like this, okay? And so um, obviously it's a private company, so there's not a lot of information on it, but they're using deep learning in sort of what's called gridding and then advanced denoising, okay, to get the better image. So they can go from this initial image to this output image Gridding refers to the fact that here you could you can sort of see that there's not a uniform sampling of case space, right? 
And so as, as we saw when we talked about parallel imaging, you know, there's going to be some artifacts. They may not look so good. And so the gridding is essentially filling in the case space that you didn't acquire. Okay. And so al although you could do that with sort of linear algebra methods, they found that a deep learning approach worked better for them um, to minimize blurring and artifacts and help make their images at a level where they thought they were clinically relevant. This is just from one of their papers showing that uh, this is um, different images on their system compared to conventional images, okay? And you can sort of see that, you know, they're not as good, but they're getting close. And so one of the things, one of the challenges, and I think what the sort of the project with the Gates Foundation is going to be looking at is, you know, if you come to UCSD, the radiologists all want like the best images, right? Because they're like, they're like the top radiologists, you know, the, the top of their field, all the hard cases in San Diego get sent to UCSD, right? If, if, if you go out to say like Encinitas or Poway and, and the, the radiologist looks at it and says, well, I, I don't know what this is. They're going to send it to UCSD because the UCSD sees the hardest cases. Okay. So the, the radiologists at UCSD typically will always want the best software and hardware. Um, but the question, the problem is that's really expensive. And so the question is, you know, what if you gave someone an image that was only half as good? Could they still do like 80% of the diagnoses? Right. And so that's almost like a paradigm shift that people have to start thinking about is what if I don't need the best image? What if I what what images can I get away with? And then if I am okay with something that's only 80% of the best, then maybe I can serve more people. Okay. So that's one of the trade-offs that's going on in medical imaging right now. Uh, and then there's designs. These are the next few designs are, I think are out of uh, Harvard MIT, which is uh, you know, sort of here just using permanent uh, magnets to make your B zero field, putting in the gradients and the RF and, um, you know, sort of a very portable magnet. So that everything is contained basically within this. Okay. And then there's electronics that drive it. Okay. Um, and then this one is something else that they've worked on where, for example, if you had someone come into the emergency room and you just want to monitor whether they're hemorrhaging or not, maybe you could just have them sit there and, and keep monitoring it with this uh, magnet. So really sort of thinking outside the box in terms of, you know, could there be a magnet that just you put on someone's surface of, of their body, okay? Okay, so this is the last slide. So MRI is basically about 50 years old now, okay? So 73, yeah, about 50 years since the, um, exactly 50 years since the 1973 publication that first described MRI. So it's relatively young, um, modality, but I, as I hope you've sort of gotten a taste for in this part of the course, uh, there's a lot going on. I mean, it, it takes quite a bit to understand what MRI is doing, um, but as you can sort of see, there's still a lot of development going on in MRI. And so it is, I think, a really fascinating area. There's lots of ways to get involved in it. And so, um, you know, it's certainly something that I think, you know, uh, is a great area for research. Okay. So um, with that, uh, before I sort of go to end of course, sort of uh, uh, business, is there any questions on MRI or any topics that you wish we'd covered or have any last lingering questions? Yes. What happens if like someone's moving in the MRI machine too much? What's yeah. Data? Yeah. That's a big problem. <laughs> so um, typically, um, like for babies, you know, you might anesthetize them, right? Or, or, you know, if there's a severe case, you would anesthetize the person, but that's obviously quite extreme, right? So typically the solutions are as follows. You come up with faster scans. So you assume maybe at least they can hold still for 10 seconds, right? So now that's the engineering. You go from a one minute scan down to a 10 second scan. Uh, the other thing you can do is what's called uh, perspective motion correction. And so there's been a lot of work in this and, and uh, there's still people still trying to figure out what the best method for that. But um, if you can track the motion, like, and so sometimes they'll use like optical detectors, they'll put like little beads and then you can have a, a movie, a camera detect the motion. And then if you know the motion, then you can actually change the gradients to follow, right? And keep the volume the same. Now that takes care of that, but think about it this way, it doesn't quite 
solve all the problems because if I'm if a if I'm if a part of the brain is here, a part of the body is here, and if I excite the magnetization here, and then it moves to some other place, and then I excite it at some other time, then I've sort of screwed up the, the, all the timings, right? So when things move too much, then even the equations become more difficult. But that's actually where sort of people are finding that deep learning works incredibly like better than you'd expect because it's it can sort of see through all that and say, okay, even with all these artifacts, I know what an image should look like, okay, based on my training. But that's also where I think, you know, right now we're at a, you know, like if I asked a lot of my radiologist colleagues, they're like, yeah, I don't trust the deep learning, right? Because, you know, that's the problem, right? Like if you, if the deep learning shows you something you and you have you're forced to make a diagnosis on it and if you have any doubt that the deep learning just hallucinated that then you need to you're going to want to look at other images right so we're still in that phase where you know what the role of deep learning is going to be is, is questionable the other approach you can do is you can just say um what's called data censoring you can just sort of say okay i'm acquiring these case based lines and anywhere i detect a lot of motion i'm just not going to use that data and i'm going to try to reacquire it some other point in time Okay, so there's a lot of different approaches. Um, if, you know, in research, we even go to extremes where, like, for fMRI, there it used to be more popular than it is now, but you actually, we had bite bars. So you'd actually go in the magnet and you clench your teeth onto, like, a bar and just hold it the whole time so you wouldn't move your head, right? And now we have, like, inflatable things that you inflate around the head to keep them from moving. So it is still an issue, but, um, yeah. Good question. Any other question? Yes. You mentioned earlier in the course about exposure with really strong magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. um, how is that not an issue with these super strong magnets that are being fixed? Yeah. Um, so the main thing with the super strong magnetic field is um, in terms of the static field itself, I mean, it is polarizing your protons more, right? Um, but the idea is that um, at least there's not any been overwhelming evidence that that is causing a permanent change in people. Uh, obviously, in the limit, maybe as you go to like hundreds of Tesla, maybe it could be an issue, you know, once it starts moving around the amount of iron in your body. Uh, the main issue that comes with the, the fields is that you actually have to, from a practical point of view, you have to make sure, getting back to your motion question, if a subject moves their head around, especially the, the openings of the magnet where the fields are changing a lot, that's actually creating a DBDT, okay? Um, and so that actually induces current, like, especially in your brain. And so uh, what that causes, it's happened to me a couple of times. Like if you, I, I don't recommend this, but this is the experiment is if you went to a magnet and you like shook your head at the opening of the magnet, you could act, you'll, you'll, you might feel dizziness, you might feel some nausea, you might, um, you know, see like like some flashing things in your, your in your eyes. It's essentially you're zapping your brain with electricity okay. <laughs> using Maxwell's equation. Okay. Uh, basically, yeah. Okay. I mean, sort of people are doing the reverse now, right? With TMS, transmagnetic transcranial magnetic stimulation, where they put a loop of things and you, you zap your brain, right? So it, it does seem to have a, I mean, any time you try to put currents into the brain, it's going to affect the brain because you have a lot, of, you know, that's the brain's based on electrical activity. Okay, great. Any other questions? Okay, so let's uh, just say a few words about end of course logistics. I don't think there's a lot to say, but let me just say a few things that might be helpful. Um, so uh, we will, um, uh, uh, meet in this room next Tuesday. Uh, the format of the presentations is essentially similar to project one in which um, we're going to use Zoom and just screen sharing to sort of minimize, you know, people hooking up their computers and not being compatible with this. Okay. So you will, if you're presenting live, you'll come up here and um, give your presentation. Um, the time limits are set. You know, it, it's a three hour chunk, so let's try to keep on time. We'll probably have a bio break sort of right in the middle. Um, if you are submitting your um, project as a video, 
uh, I think it's due like six or five or some. It's due that evening. As long as you get it in that evening, it'll be fine. Uh, basically, we just need to start. Professor McVeigh and I then just need to view all the videos so we can submit the grades. Um, so that's the logistics. Um, if you are presenting live, um, it is good to submit your presentation. Do you submit your presentation on Canvas just in case something happens with your computer? We can always present it from our computer. Um, now, sometimes there's questions like, well, what if I update it since then? So that's okay. If you wanna submit stuff afterwards, after your presentation, that's fine too. You know, we're not like in terms of if you um, uh, like, let's say you had your presentation, but you decided to change it, you know, like the minute before, but then something went wrong with your computer. We could still present the, the, the thing you uploaded or you could upload something. So if you want to upload something that was what you wanted to present later, that's fine. And just send us an email. But that I don't think that's ever happened. So it, it's not a big issue. Um so that's the logistics. Um, any questions on that? The sort of the basic logistics. Okay. Yes. So, if we're submitting like an older version of Canvas, yeah. How do we submit the and or the actual thing to the Zoom link? The you can just keep uploading. You can add things to Canvas, right? And just and say versions. Yeah, I basically, you know, let's say you submitted something and then you found them. You're, you're, you know, let's say you're going at the end of the session. Oh, the order will just go according to your number, like L0, like whatever the number of your live thing is, that's the order we'll go with. But do sort of, you know, um, do try to attend as much of the session as possible because if a group has issues or, or is late or doesn't show up, we will pick from another group. Okay. So, um, uh, you do need to be present for, you know, uh, for a good part of the session. Um, does that answer your question, though? Uh, no, I'll follow up with you. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, okay, so that's the logistics. I don't think um, there is. Um, so the only other thing I'll say before we end today is that, um, as I said before, we do want everyone to do well in the projects. Um, so uh, we've I've tried to give as much feedback as possible. Uh, through email, but uh, feel free to um, send questions or if you want feedback on what you're doing, uh, you can certainly send whatever you have. Um, you know, I've had already some meetings or Zoom calls with some groups. So, you know, um, the idea is, you know, getting feedback before you do it can be helpful to save you time. Um, a general comment I want to make is um, the... Uh, in general, what we've I found over the years for the the projects that tend to do sort of do a little better in terms of the the criteria are those that sort of pick sort more sort of focused doable you know uh, areas and sort of dive into them and sort of really understand them as opposed to trying to do a lot of things at a very sort of superficial level. Okay, so for example, as I've said to some of the groups. You know, downloading data and analyzing it and stuff, that's a lot of work. And and you might spend 80% of your time figuring out what the data format is, you know, getting the data into your thing, finding out it doesn't work. So we don't necessarily, this isn't a data science class, right? If you were a data science class, you know, I've heard data scientists spend about 30, you know, like maybe 70 or 80% of their time cleaning up data, right? This is not what this project is intended to do. We don't want you to be stressing out about cleaning up data, right? And and as a word of caution, anytime you download data, you have to just budget a lot of time for understanding what the data is and then finding problems in the data, okay? I don't want to just, if you really want to do it, I don't want to discourage you from doing it, but just because I know everyone has a limited time budget, you just need to factor that in. So what I've told some groups, for example, is, you know, it's sufficient to say, you know, maybe you read the paper and, and you sort of see a result. It is sufficient to come up with sort of, well, here's an approximation of what that graph is showing. And then you can sort of mathematically describe it or simulate it and then work on your sort of simulated version and and, and really dive into that. And, and then that way you're spending more time sort of understanding that sort of simple, you know, what we call toy example, as opposed to real data is always messy and hard to deal with. Is, is the bottom line okay and and so if you are if you're a great data wrangler 
great, go for it. But if that's not your where you want to spend your time, then it is perfectly okay to sort of come up with a simpler um, sort of representation of the problem. Okay, so that's that would be the main piece of advice I would give for project for groups working on their project. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna end here. I think um, typically we're asked to sort of leave some amount of time. So if, if you haven't filled out the course evaluations, you can sort of spend this amount of time to do that. Um, that'd be great. Otherwise, uh, if you have already, then uh, I'll be here for office hours. Um, so feel free to ask questions about, you know, either the remaining homework or uh, your projects. Okay. Um, and then with that, we'll see some of you live here. Um, some of you on Zoom, and um, so good luck with your projects. Okay, all right, on those right now.